All right, greetings. Greetings to everyone, brothers and sisters. May uh, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance. All right, a few days ago, I received a question from a friend here on Facebook. Uh, it was framed in Russian. Uh, this uh, uh, friend uh, is on a sort of Bible college uh, curriculum program that has gone through the uh, study of especially the Old Testament sort of survey with a, um, a guy who claims, uh, you know, mantle of Bible teacher, and apparently he is from the Hebraic roots or Hebrew roots, you know, he's a, a Jewish, I believe, by ethnic background, so he's using the, his knowledge of the tradition and the a Hebrew language, uh, sort of offering the insights which otherwise people who do not belong to this, uh, you know, chosen nation and so forth. Otherwise, they're, you know, they, they can't see things clearly, but there are no difficult verses. This uh, Bible teacher claims uh, as long as you pay attention to what he says, because he has this knowledge of Hebrew and so forth, he being also of the Hebrew origin, he can uh, tell you better what uh, the books of, especially Old Testament Revelation, what they, what they say and so on. So there's the study uh, through the Genesis, the beginning, uh, Bereshit in, uh, in Hebrew, that, that book is called the first book of uh, Moses. and. Uh, it was this question about the <clears throat> uh, the privileges of of the firstborn in Israel, and that uh, remember in Genesis forty nine the uh, elderly Jacob, who's also Israel, whose name is Israel, his uh, calling all his sons and the future patriarchs, the twelve tribes, and he's given them his blessing. And to each one, a particular blessing, which is also prophetic in nature, because uh, in, the, in those days and those patriarchs, when they pronounced the blessing, that would, have, that would be a prophetic blessing. Just as, remember, Isaac blessed Jacob. He meant to bless his firstborn, Esau, but he ends up blessing Jacob. And... Surely he shall be blessed, as he says, because, you know, I blessed him, and that blessing is effectual and so forth. And, uh, and this, this teacher says that um, in the course of Jacob's blessing his uh, posterity, his sons, he is giving two of his sons with blessings which suggest there are firstborn among the brethren and he says that of course the natural right belonged to uh, Reuben who was his firstborn but he forfeited that right because uh, as, as you remember he went into one of his concubines I mean Jacob's and therefore he sort of uh, uh, uncovered his father's nakedness and therefore uh, he was rejected but then Judah, he argues, this teacher, that Judah had, uh, uh, and he surmises that, uh, that uh, in the story with Tamar, uh, his daughter-in-law, remember the, the, the wicked sons whom the Lord would put to death, and then the third one he was supposed to give to her uh, in marriage. But Judah would not because he was afraid and then finally she ends up being uh, disguised as a uh, sort of a rogue prostitute you know and she she meets him uh, sort of undercover he walks he goes into her and so forth and then, then by way of the pledge he lives with with her his signet his uh, his staff and um, and some other tokens which this teacher uh, takes them to mean that uh, those were signs that he was in fact already exercising the right of the firstborn in the family of Jacob. Now be that as it may, in Genesis 49, when Jacob, Israel, 
blesses Judah, he does say some things which uh, have been taken very messianically, this guy says. that He says that, um, among other things, he says that Judah thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter, especially verse 10. Uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Bonnie his fall unto the vine, and his asses colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Okay, thus far, the prophetic blessing given by Jacob to his son Judah. Now, Judah, as you know, means praise. So the name suggests praise, and we know from the rest of the scriptures that this, that Judah was a chosen line of the messianic, of from which the Messiah came, and there are numerous uh, references to that, and we'll mention some of those, and the the fact that here he's called the lion, and in all the way in uh, Revelation five, we see the scene in heaven uh, and uh, the one who sits upon the throne and there's this, this book which is written uh, from the outside and the inside and with the seven seals and no one was found worthy to open the book and to take the seals thereof and we see that uh, in this magnificent uh, vision let's go there for a second we see uh, how um, <clears throat> it's actually spelled that uh, this Lamb of God is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, this is uh, Revelation 5, verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood la uh, a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, this lamb who is worthy, and because he uh, was slain and, and redeemed us, uh, the, then follows the song of the redeemed, and redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. This is none other but our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that. But here he is explicitly called as the lion of or from the tribe of Judah. Okay, so that harks back to Genesis, you know, Genesis 49, where Judah is called that lion, a lion's well from the prey in verse 9. Now, this, this, this guy, this teacher with, uh, you know, Hebrew roots guy, uh, he uh, postulates that uh, the evidence is inconclusive as far as uh, Genesis 49, that Judah is actually the firstborn and that uh, it is not clear that uh, that even his blessing is that so messianic, because he says that in verse 10, uh, you know, the King James reads uh, uh, thus, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, he stops there, right there, and says that it's interesting that in our Russian uh, synodal translation of the Bible that we use, this word Shiloh, which is actually a transliteration, this is just the Hebrew term, it is rendered as the reconciler, okay? Primiritil, all right, in Russian. So until the reconciler or, you know, uh, uh, reconciliation comes, so Christ is reconciliation, and it has the clear messianic uh, connotations. But he says, well, it's not that clear because it's the it's a term that is used only once in this particular uh, passage, and uh, in uh, rabbinic tradition is not 
united as to what it might mean. It might actually mean the personal name of the Messiah. So literally the Messiah by the name Shiloh, when the Shiloh comes so that we can't uh, uh, necessarily surmise that he, he shall be the reconciliation of the world because it's, it's unclear from this particular term. Okay, we, we can grant that, but our Christology and theology of the Messiah is in, in the prophetic utterances is not built upon this single verse. So that kind of surprises me. Somebody who's focused on the Old Testament revelation, which is replete with messianic uh, prophecies. So he says that from here, it is not clear that Judah is the messianic line. So because he says, well, because Shiloh is a, is a uh, disputed uh, term. All right. Okay, we'll grant that. Then he goes down to, uh, starting from verse 22, this is the blessing given to uh, Joseph. And he argues, this guy, this teacher, he says that, look, Reuben was the natural firstborn of Jacob. He was to receive the right and the privileges of the firstborn and with all the greater blessings which were the, the uh, a portion of the firstborn. But he forfeit, uh, forfeited his, his right. All right. Then Judah comes into his place, and, uh, and he says, yeah, there are some signs that Judah, uh, even at that point already, uh, was uh, exercising uh, some of the privileges of the firstborn. He, he makes some other references to, to establish that. But then uh, Joseph, he says that of Joseph, it is said here that Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Now I stop here. He makes an argument that this expression from thence refers to the line of Joseph, okay? He does not establish it textual. I don't think he can do that, but he somehow alludes to his uh, assumption. It's, it's, it's just that, an assumption that from thence he alludes, i.e., from the line of Joseph, whereas, I mean, it's more natural uh, to come to a conclusion that, look, it says that the arms of his hands, i.e. of Joseph, were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd and the stone of Israel, i.e. God is the source of his strength. God has made him strong, the, the almighty God, and from thence, i.e. from this almighty God, is the shepherd and stone of Israel. He argues that the, la the, the, uh, the latter part, the shepherd and the stone of Israel, clearly refers to Jesus Christ. And I agree wholeheartedly. Yes, Christ is the shepherd. He is the good shepherd. That's, uh, it's clear as day. And the stone of offense, you know, the rock of offense, and uh, stone of Israel, these are messianic uh, references. Yes, but from thence, it refers to God himself. So he also says that since he proceeds, the blessing is very rich, given to Joseph, he says, even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his Brethren, okay, thus far the um, blessing given to John. Yes, it is rich. I mean, it is in, in, in many ways even exceptional. But how do we interpret it in, in, um, in light of the fact that Judah, nevertheless, was chosen to be the line of David and ultimately Christ? And Christ rose from the tribe of Judah. This is as clear as day. You know, we already alluded to um, 
Revelation 5, where Christ, the Lamb of God, slain as it were before the foundation of the world, is called the Lion of Judah. Also, look at, um, I think it's in uh, Psalm um, 78. It says in verses 67 and 68, Moreover, he, i.e., Jehovah God, refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount of Zion, the Mount Zion which he loved. Okay, here we see, of course, this, this is a much later revelation. I mean, this is uh, the book of Psalms, much later point. But this is part of the same revelation. God spoke in diverse matters in different times to the fathers and the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken by in his son. So the revelation is progressive. We don't just stand upon, uh, you know, Genesis 49. And that, that's it. That's all we can gather about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So, but, but he, he continues. He says, see, Joseph, he did play the prominent role in the book of Genesis. Well, no doubt. I mean, he did more than all of his brethren. And you remember the story of Joseph. In point of fact, all of his brethren, what they did, they sold him to Ishmaelites. I mean, they wanted him to be dead. They ended him. They were jealous of him. They mistreated him. They sold him, their brother, into slavery. And then we know the rest of the story. Then he gets to Potiphar, then uh, his wife. Uh, you know, she... Uh, she gives this false report of him as though he, he was going to rape her, but it was actually her thought was the other way around to make him lie down with her and so forth. So he ends up in prison and so forth. Then he gets out of prison. He becomes then, and he's elevated to the second uh, in um, magnificence and stature place in Egypt to provide and to save much people, to provide bread in times of famine and so forth. He is a magnificent picture of Christ who's being disowned, mistreated by his brethren, i.e. us. Crucify him. Get rid of him, and so forth. So he is, Joseph is the beautiful and very perspicuous type and picture of Christ. No doubt about it. And Judah pales in comparison. I mean, Judah, the, the guy Judah, the son of Jacob, he, he, did, he didn't do a whole lot of good other than uh, at the time when, remember the... Uh, when uh, it was the second time the word to go to uh, um, Egypt to, to Joseph, he pledged his son uh, to die and, and to remain himself as a slave if the worst comes, you know, to worst. And uh, he, so he would uh, offer his life instead of uh, uh, Benjamin. All right, so and in that role, he sort of also becomes like unto Christ, willing to give his life uh, instead of another. And so in that, in that role, he is clearly also a top of Christ, but on a much smaller scale than Joseph himself. But nevertheless... We just read in Psalm uh, 78 that God did not choose. He rejected the tabernacle of Joseph. Well, why? Joseph was more prominent than Judah. Well, the Bible goes out of its way to testify that it is not by might, not by anything that is in man, that God's ways are different. And, and the Bible knows only one election, i.e. election of grace. Okay? so as to shame, to set at naught the things that are of some magnitude, that are, that are, you know, splendid by itself, as in 1 Corinthians, Paul also goes out of his way and then reminds his listeners, the Corinthian believers, that many of you were wise or noble by any standards. You were scum of the earth. Just as God says to Israel, it's not because you were murdered numerous or that uh, otherwise uh, significant and prominent and stronger than other nations. No, you're the smallest. You're the most despised. You know, smelly nomads 
you know, shepherds, who are you in, uh, in and of yourselves? But God has set His covenant love upon your fathers. And you only have I known among all the nations out there, this, those insignificant and uh, not very well-educated uh, bunch of people called Jews and so on. So that's the, how God works. He chose us the lowest two, shame, uh, the high, and those who are exalted. That's his way of, of doing things. But there's another thing that this, this teacher I'm referring to, and, uh, and he, he, you know, he speaks in Russian, he delivers his uh, lectures. He makes this deduction. He says, look, he says the uh, genealogy thing, the, uh, the Messiah could have come equally, both from Judah and Joseph, judging from Genesis. The story in Genesis is inconclusive. And even the blessings that uh, the dying Jacob gives to his sons, it is kind of, so, so we see this sort of rivalry, okay? So he sees some rivalry between Joseph and Judah as far as the right to, uh, to the, the firstborn. Well, be that as it may, there may have been some rivalry about that, but we know that God knows all of his, uh, all of the things that he purposes. He purposes them from the beginning, and he also fulfills them. Known unto God are all of his works from the beginning, and he doeth all of his pleasure, and he certainly fulfills all of his counsel. We know that from the rest of the scripture. But, uh, this guy uh, makes this conclusion. He says, since therefore, we see in the book of Genesis that uh, two tribes uh, could have been used of God to bring about the coming of the Messiah. He says, this represents how God deals with all of us. He claims that he does not predestine anyone. He does not ordain anyone one way or the other. He gives a chance so that ultimately it really is of him that makes a good or better use of the chance offered to them. So it does not depend on God to show mercy. Of course, this is a glaring contradiction to the gospel of the grace of God, or the sovereign grace of God. So he makes salvation to be dependent upon the good use of the chance. And what is a chance? I just did the, uh, the same thing in Russian and I uh, took probably, you know, more time and I used more uh, um, illustrations to, to emphasize, even with respect to genealogies. I said, look, um, even aside from salvation, I mean, we have explicit uh, statements that it is not of him that will, nor of him that runneth, but of God who showeth mercy, because the salvation is a matter of sovereign, undeserved mercy. It can't just be offered because the offerees are lost and, in fact, dead in trespasses and sins. They cannot better their spiritual lot being dead, they're unable to do anything good in the sight of God, to propitiate their own sins, to get reconciled, to just to do better than they have done, and they're already, already condemned, both in Adam and in their actual sinful actions, which they perform daily because every inclination of the heart of man is only evil in that continuously. I mean, we all know those verses, but see, sometimes, and there are even some churches and, and some branches, I can think of some primitive Baptists who affirm and say, well, as far as salvation, yes, but otherwise, God does kind of sometimes, in some situations, He makes the history an open-ended affair, as this uh, Bible teacher claims. He says, see, so the Messiah could have come both from uh, Joseph and Judah. It's, it's inconclusive as far as Genesis. And therefore, 
God kind of gives you an eye. Well, we'll see. Even though he does know the fate of all uh, things uh, he, he foreknows, but he kind of gives the opportunity. All right. So we know the, how to win this debate as far as the uh, ultimate salvation, but uh, I've heard people, even those who claim to believe sovereign grace and everything, say, look, we're not, but everything else is not that clearly predestined. And they say, well, the everyday choices were to go out at such a time and to go to this store or take a different route. And those are kind of so insignificant. And God gives you some Louis. Uh, you can move uh, either way. It is not that hard fixed and so forth. Well, let's take this genealogy thing because it has the connection. Even the, the Davidic line or not Davidic line or the line of Joseph and so forth. We, we do encounter such a sometimes tedious phenomenon of reading long genealogies in the Bible, right? We have them in the, in the Genesis, a bunch of genealogists. We have them in chapters, you know, chapters even in 4 and 5 and then 11 and elsewhere. And the, the longest probably in the book of uh, uh, First Chronicles. We have first nine chapters. Basically, it's just genealogists. And then the book of Matthew and the book of Luke and so forth and genealogies that concern the coming of our Lord. And so we have a bunch of people, we can hardly pronounce their strange, weird names, and so on. And we kind of scratch our hands and say, what in the world? Why do we have to even read all those uh, long and tedious names which we can't pronounce? But the point is this, and it's on the surface, that it was important for God to leave all this record to teach us a couple of things. The most obvious is this, that all those strange names absolutely had to be there. They're important enough to be counted worthy to be included in this, uh, in this record and to teach us this subsequent point that all of God's history, it is His story is important. It all matters. You know, all the lives of those people matter in so far. They have to be there. And you know that from your daily experience and from your uh, own uh, stories, how you came to know your future wife and so forth, it's often through minutia and seemingly chaotic, insignificant, and stupid events. I mean, you, you listen to your parents, well, uh, Dad, how, how in the world you, uh, you met uh, Mama, you know, tell us your story. And sometimes it's fascinating because when the, you know, the uh, old timers, when they begin to tell us stories, it's sometimes fascinating. And it turns out that uh, they were supposed to take this bus to go to this place, but they got sick or they took the wrong turn, they got stuck, they went some, some other way in, in a long chain of kind of uh, chaotic and seemingly uh, absolutely by chance events, lo and behold, they run into their future spouse. Okay, all by chance. Boy, you know, it was oh, just coincidence, just by you know, all just uh, incidentally just ran into. But in the course of action, they fall in love. It's just chance, you know, all just, uh, um, you know, nothing, nothing seems to be that fixed and predestined. They fall in love. And then you are born, my listeners. But if your name is written in the book of the Lamb, they were slain from before the foundation of the world. That name must have been there all along. And in order for that name to become flesh in due time in history, your dad absolutely had had to meet your mom, who also had to come from a certain line. But the point is this, that all, all of the seemingly chaotic uh, events and insignificant have their certain place and they're all interconnected.
the you know cause and effect uh, chain cannot be broken and all of the events do play their role in achieving the desired uh, effect of bringing a certain person to meet a certain lady or the other way around so all of the stories about the Jewish parents uh, going places and falling in love and so forth had to lead to this occasion where the young virgin called Mary would be betrothed to one Joseph from the house of David. So a whole chain, endless uh, chain of seemingly insignificant and chaotic occurrences have had to absolutely take place and fall into this puzzle in order for them to meet so that Jesus uh, could be born, you know. So just to make the point that uh, there are no, uh, uh, you know, nothing that it, that it comes just by by chance and uh, everything is is predestined in that absolutely so this guy apparently he does not know the lord he does not know the god the gospel of the grace of god but he spews this venom this uh, this this teaching that nothing that's uh, just everything is open and it's almost open theism all right and um it's just horrible what they what they teach and they uh, using their knowledge of ancient languages apparently this guy does know the Hebrew he's, he's you know he's, he's a Jew here using even the, this knowledge they deceive people and send this false message of an open-ended God's history and that could have been otherwise but God of course he foresees all things but it's not fixed and so forth so that uh, at the end of the day at the end of it, it all depends on how you use the chance all right i mean the better use of my chance therefore who is ultimately to be thanked who's who's responsible the one who's used the chance unto his own glory all right so that's that and i just i thought it might be worthwhile to relate this in english uh too all right, God bless you, and I'll see you when I see you.